Good morning. Uh, I start on the second lecture of toughening of ceramics. Before I start on the lecture, let me look at, briefly look back at the mechanisms and then take up case studies. You see, there are, let me toughening mechanism. Suppose I want to toughen this very sheet of paper. I want to toughen this. How can I do it? And suppose this is a ceramic sheet. One way I can do it is this is one way reinforcement formation during centering. A very classic case of this reinforcement formation during centering is, for example, the uh, porcelain cups you drink your coffee or the beer mugs, ceramic beer mugs, you drink your beer. Those are made from what? Kaolin, feldspar, sand. What happens as it is heated, the feldspar melts at temperatures as low as 800, 850 degrees centigrade. Then the kaolin, it reacts with the sand, it reacts with the kaolin, it forms a liquid phase, all of these I had discussed earlier, forming the reinforcement phase which is the mullite. The mullite recrystallizes from the liquid phase formed by melting of the sand and the kaolin. And the mullite forms. So, we will have grains which are interlocked this way. This is one grain, this is another grain. They will be interlocked with these are mullite needles and this is what gives strength to the ceramics. So, this is the type what I refer to as reinforcement formation during centering. Now, what are the advantages, pros? of this particular method. Uh, one, ease of achieving near theoretical density. Why? In the case I talked of in mullite formation, a liquid phase has formed, it has filled up all the pores and the density is near theoretical. The porosity in well fired ceramic cups is almost 100 percent of the theoretical density. Uh, two is uh, what would I say achieving near net shape. What do I mean by this near net shape? Your ceramic cup, it is fabricated, it is molded and then fired. During this firing, you will see a good quality cup, see the better ones which are costing 400 or 500 rupees there is no deformation. So, it was when it was molded by hand or by machine, that is the sh shape that stays on even after centering. There is even after porosity removal and everything. That is the second advantage. Three is low cost. And four, usually reliable microstructure. Uh, reliable, reproducible. So, you can have zero batch to batch variation. Because if your beer mug 
if in one production run you get one property and in another production run you get another property obviously no one would buy it so that's the most important thing reliable or reproducible microstructure because this is what controls the strength uh, cons you see even though I have talked of here usually reliable reproducible microstructure what I would like to say is here is a sand grain here is a kaolin as I heat it liquid forms in the intermediate zone the due to the feldspar it reacts with the liquid over here it reacts with the solid over here forming a liquid and gradually mullite needles form now yes true but even though they will be very tight if I do the firing properly as my fingers are they are interlocked that gives them strength yet it may have very well happen that the microstructure may be this uh, and hence what I would say is uh, morphology control I would not use the term microstructure morphology control may be difficult and uh, most important thing very very important thing is I will come to here is again I go back this is a sand this is a kaolin if there is too much of a liquid formed what will happen the mullite grains which will be forming will not be as interlocked as this they will be separate while these spaces empty spaces they are not pores they will be filled with liquid whenever I now have a crystalline material and a glassy material because the liquid will be glassy that is in this pores obviously the property of the whole material will vary from place to place hence it is very important that in such systems that the uh, amount of liquid which is formed is controllable and that most of the liquid converts to crystalline form one way or the other whether they give this microstructure this microstructure immaterial so long as they are long so long as residual liquid phase is almost nil hence uh, there are limited options of materials or systems available. Now, these are the pros, these are the cons, yet you see this reinforcement formation during centering this particular method is extensively used in ceramic industry be it for the beer mug or the teacup or the high tension insulators say the 400 kV insulators most of these are based on reinforcement formation during centering even let me say uh, you have seen these sodium vapor lamps uh, I had talked of this earlier but so I will bring it in briefly these are made up these are transparent to sodium vapor these are made from ultra fine alumina grains the very fact that it is transparent means the grain size has been limited and how it has been limited by adding magnesium oxide 2 percent which causes formation of the MgAl204 prevents large scale grain growth that is what I had said but please remember the magnesium oxide forms MgAl204 which also helps to bond the grains. 
So that is also a variant of reinforcement formation during sintering. Obviously, a second thing is uh, how to add, how to reinforce a material is a classic case of cement. Say addition of reinforcement. If I can do a very, very good job, then I can precisely control microstructure and morphology. I am controlling microstructure and morphology, whereas here I could control the microstructure, but morphology control I had said was difficult. And two, it has a wide range of options for matrix and reinforcement. You see, I had talked to you earlier of silicon carbide fibers in alumina matrix, alumina fibers in silicon carbide matrix. So, I have got a wide range of options. However, is it all honky dory? There are no pros and there are pros and no cons. Obviously not. So let's look at the cons. Uh, one problem. Inhibition of sintering of matrix. Uh, because here, for example, what had I done? Chemical vapor infiltration. I had taken alumina fiber mats pushed in silane, methane, they decomposed, they formed silicon carbide, got deposited between the alumina layers and then they were hot pressed to give you the ceramic composite. Doing, while doing this, there was a lot of porosity to start with because there is a fiber mats, grains growing in and uh, Hence, I have a big problem of porosity, rather the residual porosity. And whenever there is porosity, you know sintering is inhibited, grain growth cannot occur. And hence, hence to obtain close to theoretical density either hot pressing or hot isostatic pressing or liquid phase sintering. One of these three expensive methods have to be adopted and as a result addition of reinforcement this is high cost material. This is a high cost material. Most importantly, if we are talking of addition of reinforcement, by that we mean if we want to add whiskers, which whiskers which has 100 percent theoretical density, 
then I have a potential health problem. Because whiskers are so fine that would get into your lung system, corrode your lungs and the whole system and is a potential, not a potential, a real health hazard. In many countries, working with whiskers is simply banned. They don't allow you. Of course, in China, in India, where uh, awareness of health issues of workers is at times not bothered about, yes, we do work to the detriment of workers' health. So, if I am going to use whiskers, it means extra protection so that these do not get in our breathing systems, means positive air pressure mask, uh, ways to prevent the whiskers from getting in, means heavy air filters or full body suits as they use for fighting biological warfare. These are very, very expensive and uh, hence if I really want to work on the whiskers system while making sure that the workers health is protected, it adds huge value to the cost. Now, I had talked of these things, these are two overviews how we can strengthen ceramics. Now, let me come now to this when we add say whiskers or particulates, how do they strengthen the basic matrix. I had uh, talked of earlier crack shielding. What would it mean? What was let me start from the back side. Let me talk of fracture. If this is a material with a flaw here, there is a flaw, whatever type of it is, and a force is applied, what happens is this force starts propagating. And whatever this force, the entire force is basically concentrated the tip, a tip which may have a diameter of a few nanometers or 10 nanometers. Hence, the overall load at this particular crack tip is very, very, very high. As a result, what can this do? That is, I am now going to look at it. Hey, I have got a very huge force here, which is going to break the material. Anyway, can I do something that is reverse engineer? so that this force does something so that it's the energy is dissipated. Very simple. That is what my goal is. And if in this body I have materials dispersed over here, this is the uh, matrix. And uh, these are dispersed 
particles. Now, under normal circumstances, all of you who have studied fracture mechanics or anything, you know when a crack propagates and if there is an object in front, then the Burgers vector has to go around and then go ahead. And this additional length is what gives the material the strength. This is very, very well known, but I am going beyond this. I want these dispersed particles to have the property that they can undergo a phase change. They can undergo, undergo a phase change or a microstructural change. Uh, suppose talking widely of the hat. Uh, suppose these particles are let us say tetragonal. These are tetragonal particles. I now apply a force. If this can undergo a change to say monoclinic, obviously a lot of the energy associated with the crack uh, propagation that will be absorbed during this phase change. Also, what happens is if there is a if during this if there is a volume change if there is a volume change then from going from tetragonal to monoclinic obviously this volume change would resist the transformation from tetragonal to monoclinic and again cause impediment to propagation of the crack. But if there is a volume change, what can happen? Suppose this is the crack, this is a dispersed particle, the crack comes in and then due to this dispersed particle really which can have a microstructure or a phase change, what results is small micro cracks developing. These are small micro cracks. Now, with dispersed particles being there right through the phase, there will be micro cracks on all of them due to the different forces acting. As a result, you will see that these micro cracks will now intersect each other. I talked of it earlier again also. So, what they will do is now if a crack has to propagate, it has to propagate through many micro cracks and the crack tip needs very, very, very high energy in order to go through all these micro cracks because it will be deflected at every position as soon as it enters encounters a crack line and uh, this crack shielding is a very very important process for toughening of ceramics. Now, um, for example, you want to have I had referred to earlier, now I am going to details. I had talked of in one lecture that I want to machine nuclear grade steel, marriaging steel, which is the hardest known steel of all. If I want to machine it, I need a cutting tool. For those of you who have seen lathes, what do they do? 
they have a lathe which is a rotating wheel the material is attached to the lathe by this chuck it is rotated and the cutting tool comes in shaping it it can bore a hole it can shape this there are endless possibilities we have seen with lathe now here i require a cutting tool which is harder than managing steel one of the best known cutting tools is made from zirconium dioxide it is so it can be made so hard in this lecture today i will dwell on zirconium dioxide as a cutting tool to tell you how ceramics can be reinforced now before i talk of microstructure or anything you see one uh, one thing you know that the ceramic materials are very weak under tensile load but very very strong under compressive load you know that very well why is it a very simple reason let's say this is a ceramic piece and you are pulling it apart now i have always said getting a ceramic near to 100% theoretical density pore free is a ceramic design that is what we dream of but in most cases in this particular ceramic there will be flaws flaws tiny flaws which may be pores or whatever now what can happen when we are trying to pull it apart there can be surface flaws also when we are trying to pull it apart the surface flaw will open up this pores will also open up and hence this will start cracking this will start cracking and hence it is very weak under tensile load however if the load is compressive now if the load is compressive whatever the flaw is they would simply close down because here i'm applying a comp compressive load so immediately what happens they simply close down and hence ceramics are very strong under compressive load so while designing a ceramic cutting tool that is this is the lathe this is the lathe wheel uh let me see uh because there are many of you who may not have been to a workshop uh I'm sorry I don't have net sorry uh this is a lathe wheel uh it is connected by a shaft which rotates the metal or whatever work piece is held over here this gap is adjustable so they clamp it over here and then a cutting tool is pressed in because as this rotates as you press the cutting tool this chips off a part of it i urge you to look up at youtube lathe operations i have a network connectivity problem i cannot show you right now lathe operations you will see how a lathe works even those of you who have not worked in a machine shop you should do it now here let's come to this this is the margin steel or whatever i am rotating and this is the cutting tool i am pressing the cutting tool on it so that it cuts deeper and deeper and slowly it is moved 
So, if you look up the lathe on the YouTube, what you will see is the cutting tool is pressed, this is rotating and the cutting tool is slowly moved as the surface is chipped off. Now, you have to realize at any point here, this cutting tool is under this pressure. Please focus on my pen. When the when it is turning, this cutting tool is under this pressure. Means, if this is the cutting tool, it is held over here because the lathe is moving in one direction, there is a pressure over here. And as a result, this side is under tensile load. And hence, this cutting tool as it is moving in, this may fracture at some point of time depending on the flaw of the cutting tool over here. So, this cutting tool needs to be redesigned so that the tensile load over here gets converted to a compressive load. Any idea of what the design of the cutting tool should be? How about if I say fish hook style? If I say a fish hook style cutting tool, why? Because this is a fish hook. Now, even if I apply a force around here, that is, this is the cutting edge. It will try to bend over in this side. Means there is a huge compressive stress now. So, instead of the tensile load which I have with a straight cutting tool, if I use a fish hook type, what happens? The entire tensile load which is imposed on the cutting tip is converted to a compressive load because here as the force is it tries to bend out and immediately there is a compressive load and this is a much more st stronger design for ceramics. So, by using this I am converting a tensile load into a compressive load. This is as far as design aspects are considered. Now, why did I talk of zirconia? One of the many advantages of zirconia is it has got what I would say three phases. One is cubic high temperature phase. to tetragonal and three low temp uh, uh, monoclinic low temperature phase. This is the advantage of zirconia. <coughs> so, if I can engineer these cubic and tetragonal phases, in that case what would happen is I would be able to strengthen the ceramic. Now, this temperature tetragonal to monoclinic, uh, this occurs at around 1000 degrees centigrade and cubic to tetragonal this occurs around 2400 degree centigrade. If I had taken let us presume I had taken pure zirconia. What would have been my problem? 
Okay, I take the pure zirconia powder, shape the cutting tool in this fashion, sinter it, say at around at say 2600 degree centigrade, cool. The stable, what would happen is the phase that would be there present at room temperature. would be cubic primarily, a bit of tetragonal and hardly any monoclinic. However, if I had cooled this over a very long period of time, I would have gotten a mixture of tetragonal and monoclinic and hence the material would have a random distribution of phases. If I then tried to use this particular one, what would have happened under load fracture would have propagated. I have got large cubic grains, some tetragonal and the fracture would have easily propagated. That is a disadvantage of using pure zirconia. Say in refractories, which are used in very high temperature. Let us take the case of say zirconia coatings on jet engine blades or zirconia refractories uh, for melting. In all such cases where it is a high temperature, yes the weight of the melt or the load will be there. In all these cases we prefer cubic zirconia. But in a cutting tool having cubic zirconia is not favorable because the grains would fracture. In a cutting tool, what do I need? I need the crack shielding primarily and of course, what I also need is uh, the ability to absorb the energy. Hence, what we need in a cutting tool is what we call partially stabilized zirconia. Here, unfortunately, I will have to draw the diagram by hand and I hope I will be able to make a good representation of what is required is if this will compo be composed of tetragonal zirconia grains which have
this sort of a network sphere. These are basically what we call oblate spheroids. Why do we need this structure? Because if I amplify any one of these, this is the shape of the tetragonal phase. And what are we looking at? Are these two tips. So, whenever there is a force which is applied or a crack tries to propagate, it is over at this zone will the energy absorption occur. It is at this zone both crack shielding and transformation toughening will occur because here you put the pressure here I for example uh, let me put it this way I put the pressure at this particular point what is happening at this particular crack all the force is going over here which can cause local increase of temperature which causes that these tetragonal grains to convert to monoclinic. It has got two things. One, if phase change occurs, this phase change absorbs a lot of energy. Second, there is a 3 percent change in volume. So, if this is the heavily partially stabilized zirconia structure, when tetragonal converts to monoclinic, there will be a tremendous internal pressure because if all the tetragonals can convert, then there will be volume change. Hence, there will be huge internal pressures also building up, which will tend to prevent this transformation. So, as a result, what happens is uh, there is a tremendous amount of transformation toughening. That is at this edge, if a crack line is there, these ends, this end, these grains, they would the crack tip, the <coughs> sorry, the tetragonal tip over here would convert to monoclinic. But again, there is a volume restriction, there is a huge volume increase which is not being allowed and hence a huge amount of energy can be absorbed and the material can be strengthened very much. This transformation toughening is uh, not available in the cubic system. Historically, materials like yttrium oxide, calcium oxide, magnesium oxide has been used to transformation toughen zirconium dioxide. Uh, if I tend to draw a graph, this is say fracture toughness. Uh, units are mega Pascals and uh, okay. The additive content in say mole percent. Let me put some numbers. 
this is 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. These are the mole percents of the additives. And if I try to put the number over here, okay, 0, 4, 8, this should be 12, this is 16. Then with yttria stabilized zirconia, my graph will look something like this. Let me label this graph 1. 1 is yttria stabilized zirconia. Y is Z yttria stabilized zirconia. Uh, if I use calcia, the graph would look something like this. And if I used, say, magnesia, the graph would look something like this. indicating that I require different amounts of yttria, calcia, magnesia to cause this to, in, to cause the increase the fracture toughness. Now, why is this so? For that we have to go back to the phase diagrams of ceramics. Uh, where we will see that let us say let us say this is a temperature
it's complicated, but it has to be understood. You see, this CSS, which is this entire zone, CSS, cubic, stabilized zirconia. This is good enough for use as refractories, refractory coatings or any of these. Where it is, its fracture strength is not what the factor is, but where we require a single phase which will maintain its cubic state over a high range of temperature zone. This zone, is a mixture of tetragonal solid solution plus cubic solid solution is not good enough, not required for strengthening. This is the monoclinic solid solution zone. Again, this is not what I want. What I really want is the red marked one, where I have got tetragonal solid solution. So that in keeping with my earlier drawing, I have tetragonal phases in form of oblate spheres. What if, if I had this tetragonal solid solution plus monoclinic solid so solution? Here, the tetragonal solid state is dispersed in a monoclinic phase. So, now here it is part of it is large is monoclinic. So, the volume compression is not that high, but if I am where, somewhere where I have got this oblate spheroids of tetragonal solid solution, there this material is called partially stabilized zirconia and is one that is used for designing the cutting tools. We will take over from here in the next lecture.